So, hello everyone. This is the Free American Press. Your host, Alexander Horat. Today we're having a very special guest on the show, uh, Maria Horat, my mom. She's a real estate broker, and she's also from Ve Venezuela. And we're really thankful to have her on the show. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for having me on your show. It's a privilege. Well, thanks for coming on. Uh, would you like to tell the viewers a little bit about Venezuela? Sure. So um, we have heard Venezuela in the news lately. I wanted uh, to show. Um, first of all, I wanted just to say what you see in my background here uh, is a beautiful mountain in the city of Caracas, where I was born and raised. Uh, it's just one of the most beautiful places I've ever been to. Um, and it's a national park. Um, Venezuela is a country that has a lot of diversity, uh, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But I wanted to just share my screen and just um, talk about the reason why we're talking about Venezuela now, is that it's recently been in the news as US officials are making a rare trip there to discuss oil imports to help replace Russian fuel. Now with the war between uh, Russia and Ukraine, um, Biden is now uh, wanting to lift the um, ban that they had um, against Venezuela, uh, even though that doesn't change anything about what the brutal, the brutal communist dictator has done to the people. But I guess, you know, we really need to look at what's behind all of these politicians rather than just focus on any of them, because um, unfortunately, in my opinion, they're all the same. But um, basically that's the reason why I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, this country today and the impact that the economy, um, the collapse economy has had in housing and real estate in general. So um, I wanted to start by just giving a little bit of a background. Uh, last time we went there and there you are, Alex, you were probably about five years, five years old or so. Um, it was about over 10 years ago and then we were, you know, we had a great time. Uh, we haven't been able to get back there. Uh, crime rate is pretty high, unfortunately, because not only, you know, the economic collapse has led to um, the country being basically a lawless country with a lot of injustices take place there. But um, Venezuela was uh, once, you know, one of the most prosperous countries in the world. He has, uh, this is the city of Caracas, very modern architecture, um, you know, and you contrast that with the beautiful background. It's basically a valley because it's surrounded by mountains. Um, you also have uh, jungles and like the oldest place in the world uh, with the highest, with the tallest uh, waterfall in the world, uh, the Salto Angel. It's a beautiful place. Uh, really magical. It also has beautiful beaches um, of all, you know, all the areas along the Caribbean where Venezuela is. Um, and also we have snow over there. I used to work in the travel industry, um, an airline, and I was a travel agent. And, you know, I, I can find many, many reasons why people should be visiting Venezuela, but unfortunately, given the conditions now, um, over there is not, is something that I don't even dare to, you know, to go at this point. But um, so Venezuela in the 1950s was the, had the highest GDP, uh, the fourth highest GDP in the world, which is really uh, interesting considering where they're ranked today. And he also has, as of now, uh, the largest proven crude oil reserves in the world. Yep, that's definitely true. And he also has the second largest reserve of gold deposits uh, in this area here in Southern Venezuela, where unfortunately a lot of illegal mining is going on, uh, child trafficking, there's a lot of corruption, you know, all these, you know, the greedy uh, politicians of the world are involved into all of these operations uh, taking place. So the main question is what led to Venezuela's economic collapse? Um, I think there are some lessons and some parallels that we can draw from there to what's taking place here. And I just wanna focus on the um, central bank. Uh, they had a central bank foundation that took place in 1939 uh, with the uh, oil boom that was taking place. 
uh, the you know politicians and you know the people you know they had a lot of money they were making a lot of money uh, because of the boom after uh, in the 1980s uh, with the collapse uh, of the oil prices unfortunately um, and the, the politicians had basically stole a lot of the money that was coming in from the money that was being made from the oil. Um, the central bank started printing out massive amounts of money, which is what we know today as quantitative easing, which is a, a, an unconventional, so-called unconventional monetary policy as to where the banks, the central bank of a country prints money basically out of nothing. They, they buy bonds and uh, mortgage-backed securities here in the United States, and then they uh, produce large amounts of money, print large amount of money, and with uh, and what that does is that it lowers the interest rates, and supposedly this will stimulate the economy. But unfortunately, when you're making, uh, you know, printing money without anything to back it with, you're printing money just backed by debt, so which is basically less than nothing. So we had a massive amount of money being printed out, massive uh, amount of corruption taking place. By the 1990s, we had a socialist uh, president who got elected because people were looking for a savior to put an end to all the corruption. And he unfortunately, through his uh, socialist policies that he was promising, was able to uh, get himself elected as president. And that was the death, you know, the the last nail in the, in the coffin, the kiss of death uh, for the country. And um, eventually the quantitative easing took a toll, uh, the massive amounts of bills printed. Uh, they, in 2016, um, they had so much money that they didn't know what to do with it. And so one of the things that the government did was they started confiscating all the bills. They told people they needed to just, you know, turn all the bills in so to diminish the amount of money circulating. Another, another policy that they employed to so-called stop the bleeding was to uh, impose um, just basically uh, sanctions on people to not be able to buy um, at a certain price. So say the price of uh, spaghetti or the price of any goods or services will have to be at a certain amount. If you couldn't get it for a certain amount, that person who had a, um, a grocery store or was selling some kind of a good couldn't sell it. it. It had to be basically just whatever the government tells you, you can sell something for. So that created a lot of shortages. And even, you know, you had a massive inflation and also shortages, you're unable to buy nothing. And the um, average salary for somebody who has a job in Venezuela is seven dollars a month. So that's another wow. thing that is key. So Venezuela is the the country with the highest inflation rate in the world at one thousand one hundred and ninety eight percent. It has been higher. This is as of, of January of this year. I think last year was quite a bit more than that. I mean, even Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe is a sixty percent of the inflation rate, Ethiopia 33%. So we went from being the fourth largest GDP in the world, uh, well ahead of China, to being uh, with the, the country with the highest inflation in the world. I mean, that's that just tells you that that is possible, even for a prosperous country to get in, in that low of uh, ranking. We have here that Venezuela is also the uh, country with the highest debt to uh, GDP ratio. Not only you have an inflation the way you have it, but also we have the highest debt uh, to GDP in the world, followed by Japan. Um, so that has, you know, people ask themselves, so how do they, how do people do? What do they have to do in order to buy products? Uh, if you go to a store, what do you have to do? A lot of times people, the, the products are not available. You gotta ask the cashier for a certain product and given the inflation that's taking place, they'll have to check that day at that time what the item cost. And a lot of people are having to use their gold shavings or the, you know, whatever gold scraps they can find from jewelry to go and purchase items. So that tells you that there is one tangible asset right there that might help a person 
uh, be able to acquire goods and services in a, an economy when it gets this bad. The other thing that's interesting is the real estate in Venezuela. So here's an article by Business Time uh, that talks about the cash is king in Venezuela's property um, market as lenders. There's basically no lenders that are giving money for people to buy properties. They're, they're not lending any money out there to for people to buy property. I think interest rates are like six are like at sixty percent, and you have to uh, actually pay it back within six months. So that's out of the question, you know, like here that people have the ability to get a mortgage to buy a home. So um, that brings me to another interesting fact that I found. Before I go there, I wanted just to show everyone. This is the kind of scenery that you get when people live in apartments. Birds come from the mountain and they come to your uh, balcony. Um, but I wanted to show... Um, I wanted to show another screen that talks about the real estate prices in Venezuela, which is quite remarkable, given the fact that people can't even afford to buy food. So we see, uh, this is a neighborhood in Caracas uh, where homes are comparable prices to what you will see in Southern California uh, or even the Bay Area here in California. So look at this one, $3.3 million. There are some more modest ones, 149, quite smaller. But if you look at the prices that they have over there, I mean, supply and demand determine what the prices are, unless these people are just, you know, I'm sure a lot of these people are putting their houses up for sale, they're moving out of the country, but the homes are so beautiful and so great that they're just hoping they can get what they, you know, what is actually worth. Maybe this is wishful, um, just the wishful price that they, I'm not sure what's going on here, uh, but that kind of tells you that something is going, going on with the real estate. Um, I found this article from Reuters that says that an unlikely winner in Venezuela Venezuela crisis is the high-end real estate. So they are building luxury um, apartments and they're building luxury malls. And um, my question is, who's buying these luxury apartments and these luxury malls? Um, I guess one wild guess will be that perhaps, maybe there is a lot of money laundering going on or um, maybe there are you know, just the people who are in the elites are buying or investors. And this article here um, says these projects start from the same premise. Let's, uh, let's absorb Bolivars. The currency has devaluated, of course, more than 80%. It's worthless, the currency over there. Uh, when you have a system that penalizes foreign exchange operations and you don't want to commit a crime, what else you have left? I guess you just have to buy real estate. Um, so, so another thing that um, this article mentions, which can be another possibility or part of what's happening, municipal officials say multinational companies with operations in Venezuela, which routinely take write-offs and earnings statements due to the appreciation of their Bolivar holdings are key investors in premium office space. So we know that China, both China and Russia are over there. Um, you know, exploiting the oil and all the minerals. And I'm sure the United States is going to be getting involved also to get a cut. So we see that at the end, inflation, unfortunately, only uh, is nothing but a, a transfer of wealth from the middle class to the elites and to the bankers. And the, the questions that we should be asking ourselves is who is behind this uh, lie? Because we have, you know, we have seen not just in Venezuela, but in other places around the world, including now in the United States, what the role of a central bank or in, in our case, the Federal Reserve, what's their role to issue money backed by debt, which destroys the economies, and who is promoting this um, monetary policy? Who has been promoting this monetary policy from the beginning? Who is behind the curtain? Because we can blame all day long the politicians 
And, uh, but if you read the book, um, a Creature uh, from Jekyll Island written by G. Edward Griffin, he talks about a cartel. Basically the banks are nothing but a cartel uh, that manipulate and dece um, you know, they're masters of deception and manipulate the markets. And that's what we end up being at the end, just a collapsed economy, like in Venezuela. It doesn't matter how prosperous a country might be, at the end of these resources will be exploited and only a certain very small group of uh, people uh, will get their hands on. And so we need to just ask ourselves that question and we need to try to uh, really get to the bottom of it and try to organize ourselves to get out of this system. Yeah, you're definitely not to see corporations and lobbyists, especially in California, for instance, which we may see a Venezuela type scenario happen in very soon. And we're starting to see, you know, the wealth gap getting really big in California. Now, like Venezuela, there's a lot of homeless in San Francisco and then a lot of really rich people in San Francisco. So it's really, uh, you know, these big lobbyists and corporations fund both political parties, Republican and Democrat. And in conjunction as well with the banks as well. So I'm sure we're seeing that same thing in uh, Venezuela as well. So I really think the only solution is, is backing candidates who aren't willing to take money from banks or big corporations or lobbyists who have clean hands and who want to take back the country for the right reasons and for freedom. Uh, that's kind of my thought. Another thing I wanted just to bring to your viewers' attention is you have had a couple of really good guests. One is Jeffrey Matt, who has actually exposed uh, what's taking place with the members of the United Nations and how they're all coming together, all these nations, uh, their central banks, uh, they're directed by their central banks to basically unite and form an international central bank, which is basically going to control everyone's lives. Uh, he's done a lot of great research on that topic. And also, um, you had another guest, Joseph uh, Farrell, who talked about what a closed economic system versus an open economic system. He has a book called, um, I think it was The Banksters, um, the Venetian Banksters. He talks about the difference between a closed economic system and an open economic system. So these bankers, um, basically just are promoting a non-renewable source of, uh, as a form of energy that uh, basically for the world, in this case, oil. And they are, when the currencies are tied or the economy is tied to that type of non-renewable resources called a closed economy, and that leads to wars, uh, it leads to economic collapse and control, uh, government control of the, of the people. Um, so yeah. what we need to do, in, aside from what you're talking about, which is start from there, and that's actually what G. Uh, Edward Griffin on his book talks about, to start from the bottom up, organizing ourselves, uh, really uh, continue speaking out about what's taking place so more people have the courage to come forward and talk about what's taking place. But we also need to talk about these new forms of energy, actually uh, sources that I think already have been available but um, unfortunately, uh, the powers that be don't want these types of energy to become anything yeah. that can be uh, made to, available to the public because that wouldn't benefit them, but uh, that will actually benefit humanity. Yeah, you're definitely right. I actually just had a biologist on the show and he was talking a little bit about hydrogen energy and I think a company called Fuel Cell Energy that was actually making you know these hydrogen power plants, which is basically you know, like a pure form part of water. Uh, yeah. And they're able to make power just from that. So there definitely is some new energies, uh, but they can't really make as much money off that as oil. So they can't really control the show as well. Uh, so what they really want is control over others. So they're not willing to allow these new technologies to come out. They buy the patents. Uh, there was actually a uh, on Shark Tank, it's a really famous uh, American TV show where they pitch new ideas. There's actually an invention uh, to make, uh, basically it was a little cooking thing. And as you cook your food in this pan, it actually powers your cell phone and everything. Mm. So it was actually kind of making free energy in a way. And there was just a big company that just bought the patent and everything because, you know, they need to keep making their batteries or keep making their, uh, 
propane or whatever just to make more and more money to build their uh, basically outdoor prison. So I definitely agree with you uh, there. And, and there is something that might be pretty controversial and probably, you know, uh, something, that, something that needs to be talked about uh, is that we need to shine light as to who is behind all of these, who's really behind all of these. We can focus on our politicians all day long, but they are nothing but puppets of uh, just a puppet master. Yeah, you're right. And really the way we can tell uh, who's behind the politician is who's, who's funding them. That's who's funding them. all of the money. That's right. Is it, is it the banks? Is it Walmart? And then, then to really decide who's really funding them, then you look at who owns the corporation or the bank or the biggest shareholders of that bank or corporation. And, and who that control way, the bankers? Who control the bankers? So if you read that book, that's probably the best book that I have. I'm actually not even finished reading it, but it's the best book so far that I have read uh, having to do with just explaining what's taking place on, uh, on our financial system, the creature from Jekyll Island. And it just talks about there is a dynasty, a family dynasty, the Rothschilds who are unfortunately have been involved with promoting this uh, kind of monetary policy since before the uh, French Revolution. So if you go in there, you'll be able to just really read what, um, how they have been involved in promoting uh, this kind of uh, uh, basically theft all throughout the world for many, many, many years. Another yeah, thing that's true. They yeah, when we had the uh, economic boom uh, because of oil, uh, you know, back in the 50s, the Rockefellers actually built a very luxurious hotel, very luxurious hotel in this mountain right behind me, okay, a national park. After the president who was uh, the president back in the 1950s was uh, basically got out of office because there was a coup to get rid of him, um, the hotel was closed. And so now with this new president, with this new dictator that we have now, um, they open it back up, but only the elites and the people, you know, uh, only the, the elites are, are staying in this hotel, which is, I find interesting that it was uh, something that was built by, you know, uh, a family that has also been involved in promoting uh, bad economic policy that that just you know collapses economies throughout the world. Yeah, that's definitely what they do. They just collapse economies so they could steal everything, and then that's what they do. Uh, they don't care about anybody but themselves. So. Yeah, they don't have any sense of patriotism. They don't care about humanity. It's all about greed. And it's all about confusing people and just making them believe that it's just, you know, a race war or, uh, you know, inequality and all these ideas and confusing people and all these politicians, all these games that they play. But all they're into is funding both sides of the aisle and fu funding all the wars that are taking place in the world now. Yeah, that's true. And even this war with Ukraine and Russia and everything it seems very odd, the circumstances and everything. And honestly, I don't support either of their governments, the Ukrainian president or the Russian president. I think both of their uh, countries are very corrupt. And I think the people should overthrow and get rid of both um, of those governments and form more freedom governments, in my opinion. I'm gonna share, I'm gonna share the screen to show everybody uh, your YouTube channel. Would you like to tell the viewers a little bit about it and what you're doing with that? Sure. So I just started a new YouTube channel. Basically, I just want to talk about real estate and uh, just the, you know, educate people about investments, about, um, you know, the trends and information on real estate. So if you're interested, feel free to take a look. I'm just starting it now. And I'm so happy to be in your show and be able to talk about this topic today, Alex. And I hope you can continue to uh, uh, keep it up because we need more people uh, around the world um, awakening about what's, what's happening so that we can do something about it. Yeah, I definitely uh, really appreciate that. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, I don't think so. I'm just going to keep watching what you're doing and I hope to be back so we can have more conversations like this. Okay, well, thanks for uh, coming on the show and I would like to thank all the viewers who are watching. Uh, for watching this video, and I just hope you all have a good rest of your day. Thanks again. God bless. Thank you.